Welcome to Common Home Conversations Pathway to 2022, a series by the Planetary Podcast, part of the Civil Society Celebration and Declaration for Stockholm Plus 50, a half century later after the historic 1972 UN Conference on the Human Environment. In Common Home Conversations, you will hear high-level political and public figures, academics, and influential activists discuss what should be the content of the high-level declaration foreseen for 2022. Our planet faces a myriad of catastrophic environmental challenges, from climate change to widespread biodiversity loss to desertification. The science is clear. The state of our global environment is deteriorating at an unprecedented rate, highlighting the need for fundamental transformative changes across our legal, economic, social, political, and technological spheres. Thus, there is an urgent need to reach a common ground within civil society and around it, build a civil society declaration with the potential to be the needed starting point for a paradigm shift towards a safe and sustainable future for our global community. Common Home Conversations is the place to discuss the challenges posed by climate change, as well as possible solutions to help create a stabilized Earth and ensure that the Civil Society 2022 Declaration can be a true game changer. Now, here is your host, founder, and CEO of the Planetary Press, Kimberly White. Hello, and welcome to Common Home Conversations. Today, we're joined by Fergus Watt, coordinator for the Coalition for the UN We Need. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me, Kimberly. So can you tell us about your work with the Coalition for the UN We Need? Sure. The Coalition for the UN We Need began in 2017, and it was called something different. It was called the UN 2020 campaign. That name was selected because the year 2020 is the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. And uh, uh, not wanting to let a, an anniversary go to waste, we had the idea that rather than just a birthday party for the UN, that the anniversary should entail a process of taking stock of the organization and consideration of ways to strengthen the UN system and global governance generally. So those were our goals. And at the time, this was also the beginning of the first term for Secretary General Guterres, and also the first year of a U.S. administration that was keen on withdrawing from so many U.N. bodies as it did over the next few years, that had an impact at the U.N. And the second thing that had an impact in the intervening years between 2017 and 2020 was the pandemic, which came along later, of course. But both of these developments had the effect of generating uh, among many small and medium governments, a recognition that multilateralism does need to be strengthened. And uh, for our campaign, you know, it was a bit of a silver lining. And we found that uh, there were a number of governments uh, receptive to our message of using the 75th anniversary as a, a means for generating a broader dialogue on strengthening the UN. So it was in 2020 at the summit on the 21st of September in New York, governments adopted a declaration that included a requirement that the Secretary General produce a report on the future of the UN. And so this wasn't just a, a declaration that, you know, recalled all the work that the UN does, but it, it actually mandated a report and, and that report was released in 2021 on, on the 10th of September, and it's called Our Common Agenda. And that outlines nearly 90 proposals for strengthening the UN. So, you know, it's, it's um, through a bit of luck and successful campaigning, our, we've got this far. And now that report, the Our Common Agenda report, the OCA report, like we can call it, is generating a lot of conversation at the UN and there is uh, governments are now discussing processes for how they break down the various negotiations and consider those proposals, those among the nearly 90 proposals where they, they might find consensus. So it is an exciting time for the campaign. That's fantastic. We need more organizations pushing for stronger multilateralism and increased climate action. So it's great what you're doing at the Coalition for the UN We Need. Now, you previously served as the Executive Director of the World Federalist Movement Canada for more than three decades. 
Can you elaborate on the World Federalism Movement and share more about this experience? Sure. The UN 2020 campaign, now called Coalition for the UN We Need, or C4UN, began as a small project of the Canadian section of the World Federalist Movement. Just to explain what that's about, it's a long-standing NGO that uh, was established really when the UN was established and, and uh, world federalists seek to apply the principles of federalism to world affairs. And so strengthening institutions at levels above the nation state is very generally what the world federalists seek to do. Examples of the kinds of things you know, that, that are of interest to world federalists. I mean, the, the EU, the European Union, is an example of institution building above the level of the nation state that has had a, you know, a dramatic impact on politics in that part of the world and helped to keep, you know, a group of nations that went to war twice in the 20th century, uh, working peaceably in a common market and trading environment. But also at a global level, federalists are keen on strengthening the rule of law. We've had impacts on uh, law of the sea, you know, strengthening the rule of law and global governance for the oceans, where the, the common heritage principle was a cornerstone of the law of the sea convention. And more recently, world federalists served as the home agency for a global coalition of NGOs that helped bring about the creation of the International Criminal Court, a court that holds individuals uh, accountable uh, for some of the worst uh, human rights and humanitarian offenses, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, that sort of thing. And uh, we had a, a fairly prominent role in that. Uh, so, you know, it's a huge goal strengthening global governance. And the key is to find the pressure points for change and where you can, you know, have an impact and getting from the, the nation state system of today to a better governed world of tomorrow. I didn't know about the world federalist role with the International Criminal Court. That's interesting. Now, when you look at your work at the WFM and the C4UN, a common theme emerges, a call for stronger multilateralism, which is something you touched on just a few minutes ago. Given the converging crises facing our global community, climate change, biodiversity loss, and a pandemic, why is strengthening multilateralism essential? It's pretty clear now that global cooperation is going to be essential to solve global problems like climate change and biodiversity loss and the pandemic. When world federalists were initially organizing and around the time of the founding of the UN, the main problem that brought them together was uh, war and peace. That in a nuclear age, you know, un unlimited recourse to war, it, it was a threat to our existence as, as a species. And, you know, so it's interesting that over the decades since the founding of the UN, there's just been so many other issues that have come along, particularly uh, environmental issues, but also um, pandemics make it more obvious to so many people now that we really need a level of global cooperation and the social solidarity that has been brought about by the pandemic, the recognition that we're not going to beat this pandemic until we tackle it globally. And, you know, we're just going to have more and more variants emerge unless something is done to address what's called the vaccine apartheid, whereby wealthy governments have most of the vaccines and the smaller, weaker governments, you know, are slower to vaccinate their population. In terms of adequate planning and how you would address a, a global problem. It's, it's not a shining example of, uh, of cooperation. What it does lead to is popular awareness of our interdependence. And, and I think that uh, we're at a moment now, and we saw it last year at the COP26 in Glasgow, when the widespread recognition of the need for improved multilateralism is growing. You know, one hopes that's the precursor to you know, the follow on political changes that we all know are necessary. Absolutely. Now, we've also seen an upward trend in nationalism. What challenges do you think this poses to multilateralism and discussions surrounding these crises? We need to find ways for nationalism and internationalism to coexist. There's nothing inherently wrong with pride in one's country and in one's community. 
it's national chauvinism that is the problem. It's, it's you know, sometimes this can even result in armed conflict. Uh, so it, the, I think that, you know, there are many causes. It's, it's a complex analysis to get into the causes of uh, the rise in nationalism. But certainly many, many scholars have linked it to globalization and the inequalities that exist uh, also in our world today. And I think people are, you know, gravitating to national populists. But I think, I think also there is a, a, a kind of a pendulum swing back away, you know, um, if nationalism is an inhibitor to international cooperation, and that is certainly true then I think the worst is behind us. And I think the pendulum is swinging back more towards improving global governance and international cooperation. I hope so, because it's been frustrating. We all live on the same planet and actions on one side of the world can impact communities on the other side of the world, which we've seen time and time again. So it just goes to show that even beyond our borders, we're all connected. So stronger multilateralism that is inclusive is essential. Yeah. And I think at a popular level, just notions of whether you call it cosmopolitanism or global citizenship or world citizen, I mean, it's just something that is kind of creeping into our, our consciousness and hopefully is a precursor to some of the political changes that are so necessary. At the end of the day, we have to remember that we're all earthlings. Yes. yes. An earth consciousness is where we want to be. Absolutely. So the ongoing health crisis we're facing has brought into focus the inequity in our global health system. COVID-19 vaccines were developed quickly, but most of them have been dispensed in high and upper middle income countries. And failure to share vaccines equitably is taking its toll on some of the world's most vulnerable people, preventing much of the global South access until later this year or even next. The first commitment of the UN 75 declaration is that we will leave no one behind. How can we address the global challenge of inequities like this going forward and ensure that no one is left behind? Well, I would point to the, um, the language that UN Secretary Antonio Guterres uses. I mean, he picked up on the UN 75 declaration, which, as I mentioned, was adopted in 2020 and mandated his Our Common Agenda report. And in that report, he makes a strong call for global vaccine equity. And, and he's repeated that call many times and in many contexts, whether it's at the UN Security Council or in the General Assembly, his most recent 2022 State of the Organization remarks. Uh, it's a central theme. And I think beyond what international leaders like uh, the Secretary General are saying, I think it's widely recognized that we're not safe from this pandemic until we get a level of vaccination around the world that helps us overcome the pandemic. And, and uh, But we have powerful forces arrayed against the kind of vaccine equity that is necessary. The problem we're facing is trade rules and the need for uh, you know exceptions to the patent protection that large pharmaceutical companies have. Uh, there are precedents for making an exception, for example, in the development of drugs that were used to combat the HIV crisis years ago. There was allowances made that enabled governments, particularly in Africa, to produce vaccines at a much lower cost. It's called the TRIPS rules at the World Trade Organization. These are trade regulations that apply to intellectual property and, and the protections that corporations have for their intellectual property. And, and uh, that's what needs to change in the, you know, the production of uh, vaccines so that we can allow greater production of vaccines and greater distribution of vaccines globally. So those proposals have made the ideas, you know, it's, it's no secret. It's really just a problem of political will, and uh, hopefully those political forces out there who are working on this will be successful. And um, it's good that, you know, the UN Secretary General is, is, and, you know, the World Health Organization is leading the charge on this. I really like what the World Health Organization has said. If the vaccine isn't everywhere, this global pandemic isn't going anywhere. So essentially, we have the tools we need to handle this pandemic. They already exist. So it's ensuring equity in the vaccine distribution that is essential to putting an end to this ongoing health crisis. No one is safe until we're all safe. Yes, exactly. 
So discussions surrounding the Declaration on Our Common Future, also known as the Civil Society 2022 Draft Declaration, began at Stockholm 49 in October. How can having a short, concise declaration be beneficial in attracting the support of states? Well, I guess the short answer to that question is that uh, most busy politicians and diplomats and officials generally prefer short issue briefs that they can respond to either with the yes or a no, as long as the underlying research and logic is well developed and, and the technical issues are resolved. But I think your question gets at something a little deeper than that, and that is the content of our Common Future Declaration, which, although it's just one page, it contains four very big, powerful ideas. The Civil Society Draft Declaration, as you mentioned, encompasses four main pillars, the right to a healthy environment, the global commons and the delivery of global public goods, a regenerative economy, and governance and institutional solutions. Can you provide some insight on the process of building this declaration and how these four points were chosen? In terms of process, one of the wonderful things about the way that the UN system has evolved is that it has, over the years, allowed civil society organizations to be a part of intergovernmental deliberations. So while it's only member states that have a vote, uh, civil society impacts on the UN have made a, a considerable difference and indeed have been the, the drivers of progressive change on so many issues. And, and one of the characteristics of civil society is its diversity, but also there's a set of norms that, you know, that NGOs you know, just follow and, and learn to live by. And there's a consensus building process in, in all successful civil society deliberations, you know, where dialogue and debate eventually leads to consensus around what's the right thing to do and the right thing to say at, at any given moment. And, and so Stockholm Plus 49 was an international meeting that discussed what was it within the realm of the possible in terms of improvements to the legal and institutional frameworks for sustainable development governance. And that was, was a really a consensus from those meetings and, and the preparatory meetings prior to them that led to these recommendations. The first one is implement the right to a healthy environment. This is a, a newly established norm. Uh, there was a resolution adopted at the Human Rights Council. And uh, if people want to look it up, it's resolution 48 slash 13. It spells out what this right entails. Interestingly, it goes into a discussion of a regenerative agenda for um, environmental law. And, and so it, it's a piece of the puzzle, let's say. You know, it's rights that are developed at the UN's Human Rights Council. Some of them have been around so long and are, are now widely accepted as, as sort of Jews Kogans or, or universal law. And others are, are sort of on that road to having full acceptance. But the Human Rights Council is a body that discusses and adopts resolutions, uh, but it's not like the UN Security Council. It doesn't enforce these declarations. It's up to the, the actions of member states to adopt these um, new human rights standards. And so that's why there's a call here. This is a, a success story that we need to build upon. This, the fact that this right was enshrined in law, it's now international law. And so what we really need to do is, is to push governments to implement it. And so that's point one of the Common Home Declaration. Point two is to safeguard the global commons. The oceans are defined in international law through the, the Law of the Sea Convention as our common heritage and outer space, the Outer Space Treaty recognizes uh, space as the global commons and, and Antarctica is a, a global commons. And each of these three have corresponding treaties that enjoin nations in the process of uh, cooperation to safeguard these common heritage areas. One thing that's really uh, interesting and, and I would say quite bold of the UN Secretary General in his Our Common Agenda report is that he identifies the atmosphere as part of our common heritage. And what this does is it may sound very abstract, but if we take, for example, the law of the sea, the evolution of the law of the sea, there was a number of uh, unsuccessful efforts to create a treaty through the 1950s and 60s. 
there was a, a landmark speech in 1967 by a delegate from Malta that suggested that the oceans should be part of our common heritage and, and various piecemeal treaty efforts were combined in a law of the sea, a package deal. And because it was this common heritage designation means that the corresponding legal instruments were more binding. The, the law of the sea convention has a, for example, a dispute settlement mechanism and it's more comprehensive. So in legal terms to, to international lawyers, common heritage is a big deal. So recognizing, you know, where we're at with climate change and the, and the additional progress that we need to make, it was quite bold for the Secretary General to suggest that the atmosphere could and perhaps should be recognized as a common heritage, as well as the oceans, outer space and Antarctica. That's a significant development in, you know, right now, the problem with the present treaty framework on climate change is that it's, the language is different. It, the Paris Agreement recognizes global warming as a common concern, but just that the different language would communicate to lawyers that a, a more binding set of rules and a more comprehensive governance framework is required. And this might kickstart uh, strengthening of some of the agreements under the Framework Convention on Climate Change. The third point in the declaration speaks to the need to establish a regenerative economy. What we want to do is to really, um, and I think there's, you know, a growing literature around the idea that how we measure progress as a society, how we measure human development is flawed in the sense that we rely uh, too much on economic progress and we measure progress with indicators like the gross domestic product, the GDP. If you have an entity that's cutting down a bunch of forests and selling trees, is that progress or is it not? you know, the, the costs to the environment become just sort of externalities in, in an economic model that is reliant on GDP. So building a regenerative economy and a more holistic view of sustainable development and, and human progress is what's meant by the third point in the declaration. And hopefully there'll be some progress on this in terms of uh, normative frameworks uh, around common heritage and different concepts of wealth creation when governments and civil society gather in Stockholm in June. And the last point speaks to the need to prioritize governance and institutional solutions. I think the Secretary General is uh, invested in the Stockholm process. He's hoping that we will use uh, the Stockholm meeting as a, as a way to signal some of the political changes that can then be brought from Stockholm to New York to the, um, the intergovernmental deliberations that are more uh, tied to the, the OCA report. And that OCA report calls for something called the Summit of the Future, which is suggested for September 2023. So here we are, we're speaking now in February of 2022, and the Stockholm meeting takes place in June 2022, and, and hopefully we can establish some benchmarks that can influence the negotiations for the Summit of the Future. Summits, you know, in a, in a UN context often have outcome documents that include, you know, new institutional uh, and governance solutions. For example, the last major summit that influenced uh, global governance took place in 2005, and there were some major changes. You know, that's when the Human Rights Council was upgraded institutionally. There used to be just a smaller Human Rights Commission, and the new Peacebuilding Commission was created as a whole new new entity in the UN and ideas like the responsibility to protect and, and improvements to the UN development system. All of these were agreed in the summit that took place in, in 2005. And so I think the hope is that the summit of the future in 2023 can be also a, a, a significant point where a lot of these ideas come together for adoption by governments that will bring about some of the governance and institutional solutions. So that's the fourth point in the declaration. And as you can see by my long-winded explanation of these four points, Kimberly, sometimes a one-page declaration with four points <laughs> all, you know, packs in a lot of big ideas.
so that's what the team that's been led by um, Common Home of Humanity and, and are working on to bring to Stockholm. And there will be, you know, background documents that support these four points. But it's, I think it's an important and powerful declaration with some big ideas that hold promise for progress in the next few years. Very promising. I'm certainly looking forward to seeing how everything progresses later this year in Stockholm. Now, I know you might have touched on this a little bit in your last answer, but how do these four points complement what the UN Secretary General outlines in the Our Common Agenda report? Well, I think that the Secretary General, one of the important roles is he can lead. Just as in 2005, Kofi Annan led with the initial documents that presaged the declaration, the Secretary General has the power to initiate, and, and that's what he's done. The Our Common Agenda document is packed full of proposals for a stronger UN. And some of the greatest points of emphasis for Mr. Guterres are, are things like social solidarity and building trust and uh, the means to rebuild confidence in our governance institutions, reliance on data. So it's a social agenda. It's a social development agenda. There's a proposed summit on social development in 2025, another summit that would uh, occur 30 years after the first UN summit on social development. And so, you know, I think he's captured the, the moment and the mood of the times, but it, it's ultimately going to be up to member states and the bargaining and uh, negotiations that are going to occur in, in the next few years. And we're really at, at early stages of that process. But I'm reasonably optimistic. It's a general assembly-led process, and uh, those are often the most successful in bringing about um, changes in governance. We can think of the sustainable development goals and uh, treaty processes like the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons or the Landmines Treaty that began as general assembly-led processes. And civil society is, is essential to these processes in helping shape consensus and build public support and support in parliaments for these progressive ideas. Um, so I think that the Secretary General has set out an agenda. We're at a stage now when uh, governments are still expressing their views on the OCA report and there's not yet a decision on the uh, procedures, the modalities for the negotiations to come, and those will be important discussions to determine those procedures and processes and how the various proposals will be grouped and packaged and discussed. Uh, so there's a lot that could still go wrong, but I think the, the team at, you know, at the Secretary General's office and, and the Secretary General himself, I think, deserves our support. Absolutely. Now, as we approach the 50th anniversary of the Stockholm Conference, how can we build on the foundation of this landmark conference to shape a future that is both environmentally and socially sustainable? Well, environmentally and socially sustainable, those are big ideas. And I think we all have our own ways of working on these ideas, whether it's at a, a community level, a, you know, in a workplace or being active politically in, a, in national or international contexts. So, you know, Stockholm is going to be a, a landmark and hopefully there will be ideas that come out of there that resonate. But for big ideas like environmentally and socially sustainable futures, uh, you know, ideas don't work unless people do. We all have our ways of working for progressive change and uh, it's really just a matter of, you know, people doing what they're good at and what they're best at. The Stockholm Conference is a conference that is going to um, really sort of be like a, a lighthouse, a kind of a beacon that shines a light to a, a destination that we're all hopefully working toward. But it's up to us to do our part to get there. And I think we all just do what we can, where we can, when we can. And, you know, if, if you look across history and in, in sort of decades of progress, then one does see that although the problems are increasing, there's also a, a great deal of progress that has been made. You know, rights-based mechanisms are a key to progress and um, ideas like common heritage, which implicitly bring humanity together. So there is a, a, a tendency towards a unity and an earth perspective that I think is increasing and hopefully will be given a bit of a push with Stockholm. But it's something that, that everybody can do their part in, in working towards.
the good news is that uh, you know what gets discussed in Stockholm and agreed in Stockholm doesn't end in Stockholm. There is an expectation, an internationally accepted expectation, and that the Secretary General has usefully called for that. So there's a, you know, we, we can connect the dots between Stockholm in June 2022 and, and New York, the summit of the future in September 2023. And, and hopefully governments will be willing to incorporate some of the ideas from Stockholm in the summit of the future outcome document. Thank you, Fergus. Now, before we go, is there anything else you would like to share with our audience? Are there any ways for them to get involved? Well, we're not going to change global governance in, in a day or a week or a month, but there is a process of change that has begun. And um, the coalition for the UN we need, we do our best to um, keep our, our supporters and members up to date through periodic publications and mailers and update calls generally every month. And so it's, it's worth signing up for updates at the Coalition for the UN. We need a website, c4unwn.org. All right, and there you have it. The world's critical ecological situation and the challenges faced by present and future generations are increasingly apparent. We need a new way of thinking about the earth that puts our global commons at the center of a regenerative economy and as the foundation for global governance and new institutional solutions. The Declaration for Stockholm 50 proposes a four-step pathway to achieve this needed paradigm shift. Implement the right to a healthy environment. Recognize, restore, and safeguard the global commons. Establish a regenerative economy. And prioritize governance and institutional solutions. Set to take place this June, the Stockholm 50 meeting is an important opportunity to build this pathway of hope for humanity. You can join us on this pathway by endorsing the Declaration for Stockholm 50. That is all for today, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Common Home Conversations Pathway to 2022. Please subscribe, share, and be sure to tune in next time to continue the conversation. And visit us at www.theplanetarypress.com for more episodes and the latest news in sustainability, climate change, and the environment.